From this on, there were, however, to be no peaceful intervals in the career of Captain Hubert. He saw the fields of Flanders and Friedland, marched and countermarched in the snow and the mud and the dust of Polish plains, picking up distinction and advancement on all the roads of northeastern Europe. Meantime, Captain Farad, dispatched southward with his regiment, made unsatisfactory war in Spain. It was only when the preparations for the Russian campaign began that he was ordered north again. He left the country of mantillas and oranges without regret. The first signs of a not unbecoming baldness added to the lofty aspect of Colonel Hubert's forehead. This feature was no longer white and smooth as in the days of his youth. The kindly open glance of his blue eyes had grown a little hard as if from much peering through the smoke of battles. The ebony crop on Colonel Farad's head, coarse and crinkly like a cap of horsehair, showed many silver threads about the temples. But a detestable warfare of ambushes and inglorious surprises had not improved his temper. The beak-like curve of his nose was unpleasantly set off by a deep fold on each side of his mouth. The round orbit of his eyes radiated wrinkles. More than ever, he recalled an irritable and staring bird, something like a cross between a parrot and an owl. He was still extremely outspoken in his dislike of intriguing fellows. He seized every opportunity to state that he did not pick up his rank in the interior rooms of marshals. The unlikely persons, civil or military, who, with an intention of being pleasant, begged Colonel Farad to tell them how he came by that very apparent scar on the forehead, were astonished to find themselves snubbed in various ways, some of which were simply rude and others mysteriously sardonic. Young officers were warned kindly by their more experienced comrades not to stare openly at the colonel's scar. But indeed, an officer need have been very young in his profession not to have heard the legendary tale of that duel originating in a mysterious and unforgivable offense. The retreat from Moscow submerged all private feelings in a sea of disaster and misery. Colonels without regiments, Hubert and Farad, carried the musket in the ranks of the so-called Sacred Battalion, a battalion recruited from officers of all arms who had no longer any troops to lead. In that battalion, promoted colonels did duty as sergeants, the general's captain to companies, a marshal of France, prince of the empire, commanded the whole. All had provided themselves with muskets picked up on the road and with cartridges taken from the dead. In the general destruction of the bonds of discipline and duty holding together the companies, the battalions, the regiments, the brigades, and divisions of an armed host, this body of men put its pride in preserving some semblance of order and formation. The only stragglers were those who fell out to give up to the frost their exhausted souls. They did not disturb the mortal silence of the plains. They plodded on, shining with the livid light of snows under a sky the color of ashes. Whirlwinds ran along the fields, broke against the dark column, enveloped it in a turmoil of flying icicles, and subsided, disclosing it creeping on its tragic way without the swing and rhythm of the military pace. It struggled onwards, the men exchanging neither words nor looks. Whole ranks marched, touching elbow, day after day, and never raising their eyes from the ground and if lost in despair and reflections, in the dumb black forests of pines, the cracking of overloaded branches was the only sound they heard. Often, from daybreak to dusk, no one spoke in the whole column. It was like a macabre march of struggling corpses towards a distant grave. Only an alarm of Cossacks could restore to their eyes a semblance of martial resolution. The battalion faced about and deployed, 
or form square under the endless fluttering of snowflakes. A cloud of horsemen with fur caps on their heads leveled long lances and yelled, Hurrah! Hurrah! around their menacing immobility, whence, with muffled detonations, hundreds of dark red flames darted through the air, thick with falling snow. In a very few moments, the horsemen would disappear, as if carried off yelling in the gale, and the sacred battalion standing still, alone in the blizzard, heard only the howling of the wind, whose blasts searched their very hearts. Then with a cry or two of Viva la Empereur, it would resume its march, leaving behind a few lifeless bodies lying huddled up, tiny black specks on the white immensity of the snows. Though often marching in the ranks or skirmishing in the woods side by side, the two officers ignored each other. This not so much from inimical intention as from a very real indifference. All their store of moral energy was expended in resisting the terrific enmity of nature and the crushing sense of irretrievable disaster. To the last they counted among the most active, the least demoralized of the battalion, their vigorous vitality invested them both with the appearance of an heroic pair in the eyes of their comrades, and they had never exchanged more than a casual word or two, except one day when skirmishing in the front of the battalion against a worrying attack of cavalry. They found themselves cut off in the woods by a small party of Cossacks. A score of fur-capped hairy horsemen rode to and fro, brandishing their lances in ominous silence. But the two officers had no mind to lay down their arms, and Colonel Farad suddenly spoke up in a hoarse, growling voice, bringing his fire lock to the shoulder. You take the nearest brute, Colonel Hubert. I'll settle the next one. I am a better shot than you are. Colonel Hubert nodded over his leveled musket. Their shoulders were pressed against the trunk of a large tree. On their front, enormous snowdrifts protected them from a direct charge. Two carefully aimed shots rang out in the frosty air. Two Cossacks reeled in their saddles. The rest, not thinking the game good enough, closed round their wounded comrades and galloped away out of range. The two officers managed to rejoin the battalion, halted for the night. During that afternoon they had leaned upon each other more than once, and towards the end, Colonel Hubert, whose long legs gave him an advantage in walking through soft snow, peremptorily took the musket of Colonel Farad from him and carried him on his shoulder, using his own as a staff. On the outskirts of a village, half buried in the snow, an old wooden barn burned with a clear and immense flame. The sacred battalion of skeletons, muffled in rags, crowded greedily in the windward side, stretching hundreds of numbed, bony hands to the blaze. Nobody had noted their approach. Before entering the circle of light, playing on the sunken, glassy-eyed, starved faces, Colonel Hubert spoke in his turn. Here's your musket, Colonel Farad. I can walk better than you. Colonel Farad nodded and pushed on towards the warmth of the fierce flames. Colonel Hubert was more deliberate, but not the less bent on getting a place in the front rank. Those they shouldered aside tried to greet with a faint cheer the reappearance of the two indomitable companions in activity and endurance. Those manly qualities had never perhaps received a higher tribute than these feeble acclamations. This is the faithful record of speeches exchanged during the retreat from Moscow by Colonels Farad and Hubert. Colonel Farad's taciturnity was the outcome of concentrated rage. Short, hairy, black-faced with layers of grime and the thick sprouting of a wiry beard, a frost-bitten hand wrapped up in filthy rags, carried in a sling, he accused fate of unparalleled perfidy towards the sublime man of destiny. Colonel Hubert, his long mustaches, pendant, and icicles, 
On each side of his cracked blue lips, his eyelids inflamed with the glare of snows, the principal part of his costume, consisting of a sheepskin coat, looted with difficulty from the frozen corpse of a camp follower found in an abandoned cart, took a more thoughtful view of events. His regularly handsome features, now reduced to mere bony lines and fleshless hollows, looked out of a woman's black velvet hood, over which was rammed forcibly a cocked hat, picked up under the wheels of an empty army foregon, which must have contained at one time some general officer's luggage. The sheepskin coat, being short for a man of his inches, ended very high up, and the skins of his legs, blue with cold, showed through the tatters of his nether garments. This, under the circumstances, provoked neither jeers nor pity. No one cared how the next man felt or looked. Colonel Hubert himself, hardened to exposure, suffered mainly in his self-respect from the lamentable indecency of his costume. A thoughtless person may think that with a whole host of inanimate bodies bestrewing the path of retreat there could not have been much difficulty in supplying the deficiency. But to loot a pair of breeches from a frozen corpse is not so easy as it may appear to a mere theorist. It requires time and labor. You must remain behind while your companions march on. Colonel Hubert had his scruples as to falling out. Once he had stepped aside, he could not be sure of ever rejoining his battalion, and the ghastly intimacy of a wrestling match with the frozen dead opposing the unyielding rigidity of iron to your violence was repugnant to the delicacy of his feelings. Luckily, one day, grubbing in a mound of snow between the huts of a village in the hope of finding there a frozen potato or some vegetable garbage, he could put between his long and shaky teeth, Colonel Hubert uncovered a couple of mats of the sort Russian peasants used to line the sides of their carts with. These beaten free of frozen snow, bent about his elegant body and fastened solidly round his waist, made a bell-shaped nether garment, a sort of stiff petticoat, which rendered Colonel Hubert a perfectly decent but a much more noticeable figure than before. Thus accrued, he continued to retreat, never doubting of his personal escape, but full of other misgivings. The early buoyancy of his belief in the future was destroyed. If the road of glory led through such unforeseen passages, he asked himself, for he was reflective, whether the guide was altogether untrustworthy. It was a patriotic sadness, not unmingled with some personal concern, and quite unlike the unreasoning indignation against men and things nursed by Colonel Farad. Recruiting his strength in a little German town for three weeks, Colonel Hubert was surprised to discover within himself a love of repose. His returning vigor was strangely pacific in its aspirations, he meditated silently upon the bizarre change of mood. No doubt many of his brother officers of field rank went through the same moral experience, but these were not the times to talk of it. In one of his letters home, Colonel Hubert wrote, All your plans, my dear Leone, for marrying me to the charming girl you have discovered in your neighborhood, seem farther off than ever. Peace is not yet. Europe wants another lesson. It will be a hard task for us, but it shall be done, because the Emperor is invincible. Thus wrote Colonel Hubert from Pomerania to his married sister Leone, settled in the south of France, and so far the sentiments expressed would not have been disowned by Colonel Farad, who wrote no letters to anybody, whose father had been in life an illiterate blacksmith, who had no sister or brother, and whom no one desired ardently to pair off for a life of peace with a charming young girl. But Captain Hubert's letter contained also some philosophical generalities upon the uncertainty of all personal hopes. When bound up entirely with the prestigious fortune of one incomparably great, it is true, yet still remaining but a man in his greatness. 
This view would have appeared rank heresy to Colonel Farad. Some melancholy forebodings of a military kind expressed cautiously would have been pronounced as nothing short of high treason by Colonel Farad, but Leone, the sister of Colonel Hubert, read them with profound satisfaction, and folding the letter thoughtfully, remarked to herself that Armand was likely to prove eventually a sensible fellow. Since her marriage into a southern family, she had become a convinced believer in the return of the legitimate king. Hopeful and anxious, she offered prayers night and morning, and burnt candles in churches for the safety and prosperity of her brother. She had every reason to suppose that her prayers were heard. Colonel Hubert passed through Lutzen, Bautzen, and Leipzig, losing no limb and acquiring an additional reputation. Adapting his conduct to the needs of that desperate time, he had never voiced his misgivings. He concealed them under a cheerful courtesy of such pleasant character that people were inclined to ask themselves with wonder whether Colonel Hubert was aware of any disasters. Not only his manners, but even his glances remained untroubled. The steady amnity of his blue eyes disconcerted all grumblers, and made despair itself pause. This bearing was remarked favorably by the Emperor himself, for Colonel Hubert, attached now to the Major General Staff, came on several occasions under the Imperial eye, but it exasperated the higher-strung nature of Colonel Farad. Passing through Magdeburg on service, this last allowed himself, while seated gloomily at dinner with the Commandant de Palais, to say of his lifelong adversary, This man does not love the Emperor, and his words were received by the other guests in profound silence. Colonel Farad, troubled in his conscience at the atrocity of the aspersion, felt the need to back it up by a good argument. I ought to know him, he cried, adding some oaths. One studies one's adversary. I have met him on the ground half a dozen times, as all the army knows. What more do you want? If that is an opportunity enough for any fool to size up his man, may the devil take me if I can tell what it is. And he looked round the table, obstinate and somber. Later on in Paris, while extremely busy reorganizing his regiment, Colonel Farad learned that Colonel Hubert had made a general, he glared at his informant incredulously, then folded his arms and turned away, muttering, Nothing surprises me on the part of that man. And aloud he added, speaking over his shoulder, You would oblige me greatly by telling General Hubert at the first opportunity that his advancement saves him for a time from a pretty hot encounter. I was only waiting for him to turn up here. The other officer remonstrated. Could you think of it, Colonel Farad, at this time when every life should be consecrated to the glory of and safety of France? He questioned. But the strain of unhappiness caused by military reverses had spoiled Colonel Farad's character entirely. Like many other men, he was rendered wicked by misfortune. I cannot consider General Hubert's existence of any account either for the glory or safety of France, he snapped viciously. You don't pretend, perhaps, to know him better than I do. I, who have met him half a dozen times on the ground, do you? His interlocutor, a young man, was silenced. Colonel Farad walked up and down the room. This is not the time to mince matters, he said. I can't believe that man ever loved the emperor. He picked up his general stars under the boots of Marshal Berthier. Very well, I'll get mine in another fashion, and then we shall settle this business, which has been dragging on too long. General Hubert, informed indirectly of Colonel Farad's attitude, made a gesture as if to put aside an importunate person. His thoughts were solicited by graver cares. He had had no time to go and see his family. His sister, whose royalist hopes were rising higher every day, though proud of her brother, regretted his recent advancement in a measure, because it put on him a prominent mark of the usurper's favor, 
which later on could have an adverse influence upon his career. He wrote to her that no one but an inveterate enemy could say he had got his promotion by favor. As to his career, he assured her that he looked no farther forward into the future than the next battlefield. Beginning the campaign of France in this dogged spirit, General Hubert was wounded on the second day of the battle under Léon. While being carried off the field, he heard that Colonel Farad, promoted this moment to general, had been sent to replace him at the head of his brigade. He cursed his luck impulsively, not being able at the first glance to discern all the advantages of a nasty wound. And yet it was by this heroic method that Providence was shaping his future. Traveling slowly south to his sister's country home under the care of a trusty old servant, General Hubert was spared the humiliating contacts and the perplexities of conduct which assailed the men of Napoleonic Empire at the moment of its downfall. Lying in his bed with the windows of his room open wide to the sunshine of Provence, he perceived the undisguised aspect of the blessing conveyed by that jagged fragment of a Prussian shell, which, killing his horse and ripping open his thigh, saved him from an active conflict with his conscience. After the last fourteen years spent, sword in hand, in the saddle, and with the sense of his duty done to the very end, General Hubert found resignation an easy virtue. His sister was delighted with his reasonableness. I leave myself altogether in your hands, my dear Leone, he had said to her. He was still laid up when, the credit of his brother-in-law's family being exerted on his behalf, he received from the royal regiment not only the confirmation of his rank, but the assurance of being retained on the active list. To this was added an unlimited convalescence leave. The unfavorable opinion entertained of him in Bonapartist circles, though it rested on nothing more solid than the unsupported pronouncement of General Farad, was directly responsible for General Hubert's retention on the active list. As to General Farad, his rank was confirmed too. It was more than he dared to expect, but Marshal Slout, then Minister of War to the restored King, was partial to officers who had served in Spain. Only not even the Marshal's protection could secure for him active employment. He remained irreconcilable, idle, and sinister. He sought in obscure restaurants the company of other half-pay officers who cherished dingy but glorious old tricolor cockades in their breast pockets and buttoned with the forbidden eagle buttons their shabby uniforms declaring themselves too poor to afford the expense of the prescribed change. The triumphant return from Elba, an historical fact as marvelous and incredible as the exploits of some mythological demigod, found General Hubert still unable to sit a horse. Neither could he walk very well. These disabilities, which made Madame Leone accounted most lucky, helped to keep her brother out of all possible mischief. His frame of mind at that time, she noted with dismay, became very far from reasonable. This general officer, still menaced by the loss of a limb, was discovered one night in the stables of the chateau by a groom, who, seeing a light, raised an alarm of thieves. His crutch was lying half-buried in the straw of the litter, and the general was hopping on one leg in a loose box around a snorting horse with a he was trying to saddle. Such were the effects of imperial magic upon the calm temperament and a pondered mind. Beset in the light of stable lanterns by the tears, entreaties, indignation, remonstrations, and reproaches of his family, he got out of the difficult situation by fainting away there and then in the arms of his nearest relatives, and was carried off to bed. Before he got out of it again, the second reign of Napoleon, the hundred days of feverish agitation and supreme effort, had passed away like a terrifying dream. The tragic year, 1815, begun in the trouble and unrest of consciences was ending in vengeful prescriptions. 
how General Farad escaped the clutches of the Special Commission and the last offices of a firing squad he never knew. It was partly due to the subordinate position he was assigned during the Hundred Days. The Emperor had never given him active command, but he had kept him busy at the cavalry depot in Paris, mounting and dispatching hastily drilled troops into the field. Considering this task as unworthy of his abilities, he had discharged it with no, no offensively noticeable zeal, but for the greater part he was saved from the excesses of royal reaction by the interference of General Hubert. This last, still on convalescent leave, but able now to travel, had been dispatched by his sister to Paris, to present himself to his legitimate sovereign. As no one in the capital could possibly know anything of the episode in the stable, he was received there with distinction. Military to the very bottom of his soul, the prospect of rising in his profession consoled him from finding himself the butt of Bonapartist malevolence which pursued him with a persistence he could not account for. All the rancor of that embittered and persecuted party pointed to him as the man who had never loved the emperor, a sort of monster essentially worse than a mere betrayer. General Hubert shrugged his shoulders without anger at this ferocious prejudice. Rejected by his old friends and mistrusting profoundly the advances of royalist society, the young and handsome general, he was barely forty, adopted a manner of cold, punctilious courtesy, which at the merest shadow of an intended slight passed easily into harsh haughtiness. Thus prepared, General Hubert went about his affairs in Paris, feeling inwardly very happy, with the peculiar uplifting happiness of a man very much in love. The charming girl looked out by his sister had come upon the scene, and had conquered him in the thorough manner in which a young girl by merely existing in his sight can make a man of forty her own. They were going to be married as soon as General Hubert had obtained his official nomination to a promised command. One afternoon, sitting on the terrace of the Café Tortoni, General Hubert learned from the conversation of two strangers occupying a table near his own that General Farad included in the batch of superior officers arrested after the second return of the king was in danger of passing before the special commission. Living all his spare moments, as is frequently the case with expectant lovers, a day in advance of reality and in a state of bestarred hallucination, it required nothing less the name of his perpetual antagonist pronounced in a loud voice to call the youngest of Napoleon's generals away from the mental contemplation of his betrothed. He looked round. The strangers wore civilian clothes, lean and weather-beaten. Lolling back in their chairs, they scowled at people with moody and defiant abstraction from under their hats pulled low over their eyes. It was not difficult to recognize them for two of the compulsory retired officers of the old guard, as from the bravado or carelessness they chose to speak in loud tones, General Hubert, who saw no reason why he should change his seat, heard every word. They did not seem to be the personal friends of General Farad. His name came up amongst others. Hearing it repeated, General Hubert's tender anticipations of a domestic future, adorned with a woman's grace, were traversed by the harsh regret of his warlike past, of that long, intoxicating clash of arms, unique in the magnitude of its glory and disaster, the marvelous work and the special possession of his own generation. He felt an irrational tenderness toward his old adversary, and appreciated emotionally the murderous absurdity their encounter had introduced into his life. It was like an additional pinch of spice in a hot dish. He remembered the flavor with sudden melancholy. He would never taste it again. It was all over. I fancy it was being left lying in the garden that had exasperated him so against me from the first, he thought indulgently. 
The two strangers at the next table had fallen silent after the third mention of General Farad's name. Presently, the elder of the two, speaking again in a bitter tone, affirmed that General Farad's account was settled. And why? Simply because he was not like some bigwigs who loved only themselves. The royalists knew they could never make anything of him. He loved the other too well. The other was the man of St. Helena. The two officers nodded and touched glasses before they drank to an impossible return. Then the same, who had spoken before, remarked with a sardonic laugh. His adversary showed more cleverness. What adversary? asked the young man, as if puzzled. Don't you know? They were two hussars. At each potion they fought a duel. Haven't you heard of the duel going on ever since 1801? The other had heard of the duel, of course. Now he understood the illusion. General Baron Hubert would be able now to enjoy his fat king's favor and peace. Much good may do it to him, mumbled the elder. They were both brave men. I never saw this Hubert, a sort of intriguing dandy, I am told. But I can well believe that I have heard Farad say of him that he never loved the emperor. They rose and walked away. General Hubert experienced the horror of a somnambulist who wakes up from a complacent dream of activity to find himself walking on a quagmire. A profound disgust of the ground on which he was making his way overcame him. Even the image of the charming girl was swept from his view in the flood of moral distress. Everything he had ever been or hoped to be would taste a bitter ignominy unless he could manage to save General Farad from the fate which threatened so many braves. Under the impulse of this almost morbid need to attend to the safety of his adversary, General Hubert worked so well with hands and feet, as the French saying is, that in less than twenty-four hours he found means of obtaining an extraordinary private audience from the Minister of Police. General Baron Hubert was shown in suddenly, without preliminaries, in the desk of the Minister's cabinet, behind the forms of writing desks, chairs, and tables, between two bunches of wax candles, blazing in sconces, he beheld a figure in a gorgeous coat posturing before a tall mirror, the old conventionnel Fauché, senator of the empire, traitor to every man, to every principle and motive of human conduct, duke or vortanto, and the wily artisan of the second restoration, was trying the fit of a court suit in which his young, an accomplished fiancé had declared her intention to have his portrait painted on porcelain. He was a caprice, a charming fancy, which the first minister of police of the Second Restoration was anxious to gratify. For that man, often compared in wiliness of conduct to a fox, but whose ethical side could worthily be symbolized by nothing less empathetic than a skunk, was as much possessed by his love as General Hubert himself. Startled to be discovered thus by the blunder of a servant, he met this little vexation with a characteristic impudence which had served his turn so well in the endless intrigues of his self-seeking career. Without altering his attitude a hair's breadth, one leg in a silk stocking advanced, his head twisted over his shoulder, he called out calmly, this way, General, pray approach. Well, I am all attention. While General Hubert, ill at ease if one of his own little weaknesses had been exposed, presented his request as shortly as possible. The Duke of Veranto went on feeling the fit of his collar, settling the lapels before the glass and buckling his back in an effort to behold the set of the gold-embroidered coat skirts behind, his still face, his attentive eyes, could not have been expressed a more complete interest in those matters if he had been alone. Exclude from the operations of the special court a certain Farad Gabriel Florian, general of the brigade of the promotion of 1814, he repeated on a slightly 
wondering tone, and then turned away from the glass. Why exclude him precisely? I am surprised that Your Excellency, so competent in the evaluation of men of his time, should have thought worthwhile to have that name put down on this list. A rabid Bonapartist! So is every grenadier, and every trooper of the army, as Your Excellency well knows. And the individuality of General Farad can have no more weight than that of any casual grenadier. He is a man of no mental grasp, of no capacity whatever. It is inconceivable that he should ever have any influence. He has a well-hung tongue, though, interjected Fouché. Noisy, I admit, but not dangerous. I will not dispute with you. I know next to nothing of him, hardly his name, in fact. And yet Your Excellency has the presidency of the commission charged by the king to point out those who were to be tried, said General Hubert, with an emphasis which did not miss the minister's ear. Yes, General, he said, walking away into the dark part of the vast room and throwing himself into a deep armchair that swallowed him up all but the soft gleam of gold embroideries in the pallid patch of his face. Yes, General, take this chair here. General Hubert sat down. Yes, General, continued the Archmaster of the Arts of Intrigue and Betrayals, whose duplicity, as if at times intolerable to his self-knowledge, found release in bursts of cynical openness. I did hurry on the information of the proscribing commission, and I took its presidency. And do you know why? Simply from fear that I did not take it quickly into my hands, my own name would head the list of the proscribed. Such are the times in which we live. But I am minister of the king yet, and I ask you plainly why I should take the name of this obscure Farad off the list. You wonder how this name got there. Is it possible that you should know men so little? My dear general, at the very first, sitting of the commission names poured on us like rain off the roof of the Tudiers. Names, we had our choice of thousands. How do you know? that the name of this Farad, whose life or death doesn't matter to France, does not keep out some other name. The voice out of the armchair stopped. Opposite General Hubert sat still, shadowy and silent. Only his saber clinked slightly. The voice in the armchair began again, and we must try to satisfy the exigencies of the Allied Sovereigns too. The Prince de Talleyrand told me only yesterday that Nesselrod had informed him officially of His Majesty the Emperor Alexander's dissatisfaction at the small number of examples the government of the king intends to make, especially amongst military men. I tell you this confidentially. Upon my word, broke out General Hubert, speaking through his teeth, if Your Excellency dines to favor me with any more confidential information, I don't know what I will do. It's enough to break one's sword over one's knee and fling the pieces. What government you imagine yourself to be serving, interrupted the minister sharply. After a short pause, the crestfallen voice of General Hubert answered, The government of France. That's paying your conscience off with mere words, General. The truth is that you are serving a government of returned exiles, of men who have been without country for twenty years, of men who have just got over a very bad and humiliating fright. Have no illusions on that score. The Duke of Otranto ceased. He had relieved himself and had attained his object of stripping some self-respect off that man who had inconveniently discovered him posturing in a gold-embroidered court costume before a mirror. But they were a hot-headed lot in the army, and it occurred to him that it would be inconvenient if a well-disposed general officer received an audience on the recommendation of one of the princes were to do something rashly scandalous directly after a private interview with the minister. In a changed tone, he put a question to the point. 
Your relation, this fraud? No, no relation at all. Intimate friend? Intimate, yes. This is between an intimate connection of a nature which makes its point of honor with me to try. The minister rang a bell without waiting for the end of the phrase. When the servant had gone out after bringing in a pair of heavy silver candelabra for the writing desk, the Duke of Otranto rose, his breast glistening all over with gold in the strong light, and taking a piece of paper out of a drawer, held it in his hand ostentatiously, while he said with pervasive gentleness, You must not speak of breaking your sword across your knee, General. Perhaps you would never get another. The Emperor will not return this time. Diable de Homme. There was just a moment here in Paris, soon after Waterloo, when he frightened me. It looked as though he were ready to begin all over again. Luckily, one never does begin all over again, really. You must not think of breaking your sword, General. General Hubert, looking on the ground, moved slightly his hand in a hopeless gesture of your renunciation. The Minister of Police turned his eyes away from him and scanned deliberately the paper he had been holding up all the time. There are only twenty general officers selected to be made an example of. Twenty, a round number. Now let's see, fraud. Ah, here's there. Gabriel Florian, Parfaitement. That's your man. Well, there will be only nineteen examples made now. General Hubert stood up, feeling as though he had gone through an infectious illness. I must beg your excellency to keep my interference a profound secret. I attach the greatest importance to his never learning. Who is going to inform him, I should like to know, said Fouché, raising his eyes curiously to General Hubert's tense, set face. Take one of these pens and run it through the name yourself. This is the only list in existence. If you are careful to take up enough ink, no one will be able to tell what was the name struck out. But, par example, I am not responsible for what Clark will do with him afterwards. If he persists in being rabid, he will be ordered by the Minister of War to reside in some provincial town under the supervision of the police. 